I would like in this and next week's sermon to speak about the highly fraught subject of homosexuality. Necessarily, I will need to be selective and brief, although I wish I could be even briefer, because of the obvious time constraints. Although I'm somewhat helped by the fact that the Bible doesn't say that much about homosexuality, hardly anything at all, in fact. And that makes my task a little easier, though the topic is huge. In this sermon, I want to look at the Jewish scriptures, known to Christians as the Old Testament, and next week I will consider some verses from the New Testament. And I'll concentrate almost exclusively today on two verses from the Old Testament book of Leviticus, not a book that we read that often in church, in fact, just one passage in three years, every three years. But it's an important book for our purposes because it contains two seemingly unambiguous, verse, unambiguous verses prohibiting sex between a man and another man. The first is a Le a Leviticus 18, verse 22. It's there on your sermon outlines, uh, which you would have received as you came in. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. The second is Leviticus 20, verse 13. If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall be put to death. Their blood is upon them. Now, those are two pretty straightforward verses, as clear a prohibition of homosexual practice as anywhere in all of the scriptures, and arguably the basis for later prohibitions. And just in case we didn't quite get the seriousness of the prohibition, Leviticus 20 treats this as a capital offence, requiring the death penalty. Both verses describe this activity as an abomination, which is a strong word of disapproval, the root meaning of which is to abhor or to detest. What do we make of these verses? What should we do with them in a world that is fast coming to accept homosexual practice as acceptable to the point that Barack Obama can winningly come out in favour of same-sex marriage, a seemingly risky thing to do in a place like the US. I'm from Canada, by the way. Um, just so you know. <laughs> uh, a, a risky thing to do in a place like the US, but uh, most pundits agree it contributed to his re-election. What do we make of these verses? One approach is to say, well, too bad that society has gone a different way on this. It's always been the way. In fact, these prohibitions were articulated in a context where homosexual practice was widely accepted. And God said, no. We have no room to move on this. It may be that at the end of these two sermons, we come to that same conclusion. There is a lot going for it and a lot at stake in going a different way. These words purport to be the very words of God, spoken in the immediate aftermath of God's rescue of the people of Israel from Egypt. They're still within sight of Sinai, being given instructions about what sort of nation they will be, with God himself, the sole legislator of, of what they will do and who they will be. There's to be no sex between males. It is an abomination. There doesn't seem to be too much room to move on this one, which goes a long way to explaining the vehemence of opposition to any watering down of these verses, any attempt to sidestep their implications. And it's not just a matter of sex for many Christians, including Archbishop Peter, who sees this as primarily an issue of authority, an important test case for whether we believe and submit to the Bible as a supreme authority in matters of faith and life. Do we have any room to move on this as Christians? Maybe. Some have argued that these verses from Leviticus, although they seem so absolute on first reading, are set in a context of all sorts of laws that we no longer adhere to as Christians, 
There are laws about not eating pork. We eat pork. We had a pork roast last night. Very nice. <laughs> there are laws about not mixing linen and wool in garments we make. We mix all sorts of fabrics together. There are laws about not eating sea creatures that don't have fins or scales. Prawns, for example. We eat prawns. There are all sorts of ceremonial laws, food laws and purity laws, which we no longer observe, despite the fact that in Leviticus and elsewhere in the Old Testament, these activities are described as an abomination. That word again. And so it's not quite so simple as to say God says it, or the Bible says it, therefore we must do it or not do it. There are those who seek to get around these prohibitions by arguing that we Christians are no longer under law, but under grace. and Therefore, we don't need to take notice of any of these laws. That's not such a good move. As we're about to see, included among these laws from Leviticus are laws against adultery, against incest, against child sacrifice and bestiality. I don't know too many people who think that we should set these aside or that these laws don't have continuing purchase. Certainly the principles that underlie them do. One of the disappointing things about this debate occurring within society and church is that people run too quickly to solutions that are possible, but in some cases far-fetched and unhelpful. We all have to do the hard work, not just of listening to each other, but also to texts like these from Leviticus. So let's now, have a do, let's, have, let's now have a go at doing this, listening a little more intently and closely to these texts. First of all, what do the verses mean? Or more specifically, what are they likely to have meant when first written down and included in this book of Leviticus? Leviticus 18.22 says, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. More literally still, the verse reads, and with or at a male, you shall not lie the lyings of a woman. It is abhorrent. The choice of the Hebrew words suggests something that is done to a person or at a person, not so much with as at, something you might do to something, to someone. There is no hint of this being an expression of love or intimacy or mutuality. This is an action, essentially penetrative sex. The word to lie has the same connotations as it does for us. It means having sex. And sex in the ancient world was generally understood as intercourse. The writer could have written, don't lie, a male shouldn't lie with a male, full stop. But he added the lyings of a woman, probably to make it crystal clear that what is on view here is a male having sex with a male in the same manner as he would have sex with a woman though with an obvious anatom anatomical variation involved. Leviticus 20 verse 13 specifies penalties, not just for the active partner in such behavior, but the passive or receptive partner as well. Both are to be put to death. Why so? Well, the context provides a number of clues. Chapter 18 begins with a note of promise and exhortations to obedience and to the exclusive worship of Yahweh, and ends with a threat of curse and exile should people make themselves impure by engaging in practices such as male-to-male -male intercourse. In the middle of the chapter is a list of prohibited actions, all of which are described as abhorrent or as an abomination at the end of the chapter. These prohibited actions are having sex with one's next of kin, having sex with one's wife when she's menstruating, having sex with one's neighbor's wife, having sex with the male, having sex with an animal. Chapter 2020 also contains a list of prohibited actions, not just sexual, but we'll restrict ourselves to those. And the list is a little longer and more detailed. A man having sex with his neighbor's wife, a man having sex with his father's wife, with his daughter-in-law, with a man, with a mother and her daughter, with an animal and a woman having sex with an animal. Now, there are a few things to notice about this list, these lists. You might notice that almost all the prohibitions are addressed to men, reflecting the patriarchal nature of the society into which these 
instructions were given. They are addressed to those understood to be the likely initiators, the ones with the overwhelming power and responsibility in relationships of these sorts. You may also have noticed that women are not prohibited from having sex with each other. Maybe that's significant, maybe not. Possibly these actions are not understood to be sex. One thing you won't have missed is that most of these actions, if not all, we would disapprove of. In some, most cases, quite strongly and rightly so. The offences here appear to increase in seriousness in both lists, with, a, with almost all of them requiring the death penalty. It kind of raises the question, doesn't it, if we want to be obedient to the spirit and letter of these words, whether we should be advocating for the death penalty in such cases. Even if in a society like ours, well, we couldn't do that, couldn't. Is that what we might think is appropriate or right? In some parts of the world, it does still happen. It makes you wonder, you know, if we're going to be obedient to the spirit and the letter of these words, would we go so far? Some people think we should. Do we? That's a serious question uh, and nicely raises the question facing us this morning. What do we do with these verses? How do we understand and apply them in a 21st century world? Why did the writers of Leviticus, those who drew these instructions together into a complete manuscript of instructions, which now lies at the center of the Torah, why did they include sex between men in their list of sexual offenses requiring the death penalty? What was their rationality? Why did they think it wrong? One suggestion, which I think has a lot going for it, is that it deviates, like most of the other offences, from the biblical ideal of sex, which is found in Genesis 1 and 2, sex between a man and his wife. That certainly makes some sense of these passages, but it is limited by the fact that the Bible does acknowledge the existence of exceptions to this idealised picture, things that are not considered abhorrent or deserving of death. Having more than one wife, for example, and in some cases, for those who could afford it, a concubine. There was also the highly encouraged custom of Leverite marriage, as we saw in the story of Ruth and Boaz here a few weeks ago, where, the next of, where sex with the next of kin was not only accept, acceptable, but necessary to carry on a husband's line in, in the case where the, where the husband dies, not leaving offspring or producing offspring. So the Bible itself allows exceptions to these rules. They are not absolute or in all cases, in all cases or necessarily. Having said that, it is clear enough that Leviticus does rule out sex between a man and another man. The only forms of acceptable sex are between a man and a woman or women. Why is that? Why is that? I've come across two understandings that make sense to me and of these passages, two complementary ways to understand why same-gender sex was considered abhorrent. The first of these two understandings is that such behaviour is a threat to the very order of creation in that it confounds the gender divide. In Genesis 1, God is described as bringing order out of chaos. He separates the day from the night, the land from the sea, sea animals from land animals and from animals that fly above the earth. God as creator separates things that need to stay separate. Parents must not mix sexually with children in what we describe as incest. Humans shouldn't mix sexually with animals, bestiality. Women and men are made to, to mix sexually with each other, not with someone of their own gender. Theirs is a complementary unity with the female created for the man who is her master. She is his property in the world of that day. The gender divide, according to this way of understanding, is woven into the very fabric of nature as God has devised it. And so any confusion of this order is a violation of God's creative intentions. 
because male-to-male -male sexual relations involve at least one party in assuming the receptive role of a woman, it confuses these categories. A male is forced to act like a woman, and this is perverse. A second rationale related to the first is that when categories are blurred, when things that are separated are joined, creation begins to disintegrate, order descends into disorder, and the threat of chaos becomes real. There is a way of life and there is a way of death, and to confuse categories is to go the way of death, individually, socially, and creationally. At the end of Leviticus 18 is a graphic description of the promised land vomiting out its original occupants because of their abominable practices, which become a warning to the Israelites not to follow suit and engage in category bending and therefore defiling behavior. Sex between men, according to this way of understanding, doesn't just bend categories. It is an essentially violent and destructive act. In the world of these instructions, being penetrated by another male was the height of disgrace, an act often designed to humiliate. It is not accidental that in the only story in the whole of the Bible that describes same-gender sex, or at least threatens same-gender sex, the story of Sodom, violent and deliberately humiliating sex is on view. Here is the story of a society that has become degenerate sexually and in every way. It's not a pretty picture, but it does illustrate the attitude of the biblical writers to same-gender sex. It wasn't the brief sermon, was it? It wasn't the brief sermon. It's still going. Now, does all this help us? I think it does. Does it help to negotiate a way forward for us in our time and space? I think it does, or it does for me in two ways. Firstly, I think we can acknowledge that there are things about this way of thinking that we would want to go along with, which make good sense. There are things that humans do that diminish us and humiliate others. There are boundaries that need to be set in place to protect us and others. There is behavior that dehumanizes and degrades, including pedophilia, bestiality, and rape. And societies that give themselves to such behavior do disintegrate and become ugly. These passages from Leviticus remind us of this sad possibility. But there is a second way in which this understanding of the passage helps us, and that is that it tells us that in some ways, in some ways, we have moved on to new and better understandings of what is good and acceptable human behavior. We have left behind or we keep trying to leave behind the highly stratified way of organizing, organizing society implicit and sometimes explicit in these and surrounding instructions with men in charge at the top and children and slaves underneath with next to no rights and next to no power. We become more aware of the potential for the abuse of power when the power differential is so heavily weighted in the favour of men as it was in ancient civilizations, including Israel, where, as we've noted, women were considered to be the property of men. Re go back and read through the instructions in Leviticus and the assumption is that women and children and slaves are all the property of men. We no longer think it such a shocking thing for a man to be like a woman in one way or another. In fact, we celebrate such unusual sensitivity. We become rightly critical of attitudes and institutions that assume or enshrine the inferiority of women or that there is such a thing as a woman's place. We have, in other words, dispensed with patriarchy and at least most of us were cheering when the Prime Minister recently put her opposite number to the sword on the issue of misogyny. We've also become more comfortable with difference because in actual fact, the world is filled with difference. We're not all the same. Men are not all the same. Women are not all the same. The sex and gender divide is much more porous and fuzzy than maybe we once thought with as many as 1.9% of people, as many people who are as, re as are redhead, with as many as 1.9% of people born with bodily characteristics that are male and female people referred to as intersex. 
some of whom are also lesbian or gay or bisexual or transsexual, with all sorts of variations along what is more of a continuum than a binary arrangement. Under the impact of evolutionary theory, we have come to see that human nature, including sexuality, is not so much fixed as dynamic, varied and variable. What do we uh, make of all this? What impact does this have on our reading of these two verses from Leviticus? In short, we need, I think, to be open to the possibility that understandings can and do change, and sometimes, sometimes they change for the better. The Levitical writers believed, I am sure, that they were representing the will of God for their people and for that time, so much so that they had these instructions come from the very mouth of God. But understandings do change, even within and throughout the Bible. Jesus felt able to discard the purity laws of the Old Testament, opening up for us the delight of eating prawns and pork. He critiqued contemporary expressions of patriarchy, setting in train a process that would see it so modified that it would become irrelevant, which I believe it now is. Living as we do in a non-stratified world, the way opens the way for a rethinking of the unstoppable love and affection that develops between all people, where being somewhat like a woman and someone like a man does not represent a violation of the natural order, but simply another of its fascinating variations, filled with potential for intimacy, love and commitment, for the enrichment of society, not its dissolution or destruction. So it may be that there is a way forward on this matter of homosexuality after all. Maybe so. I hope so. For more on this exciting, perhaps scary journey, come back next week and we'll look at what the New Testament says on this issue. And let's all keep talking, thinking and praying. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. During the last couple of weeks, I've been hearing and reading stories. Stories both similar and different to my own. Different because the people I've been listening to or reading about appear to be wired differently to me, sexually. Unlike me. They discovered mostly in adolescence that they were attracted to people of the same gender. <coughs> Let me share with you just one of those stories. It is the story of a devoutly Christian man who grew up in the 50s and 60s in the deep south of the US in what we would describe as a fundamentalist church. He was a bright young man, always shone in Sunday school. He was the pride and joy of his mum and dad. He still is. He was remarkably talented and a fervent disciple of Jesus. He still is. But when he went through that sometimes scary transition called puberty, he discovered to his growing alarm that the, that the suddenly aroused attraction of his peers towards members of the opposite sex was matched by no such attraction in him. And so he pretended to be interested in that way. He knew to keep his mouth closed about what he was fast learning about himself, that he was different in ways that he knew his church disapproved of. He knew his Bible well enough to know of its apparent condemnation of homosexuality. When years later he asked his fiancée to marry him, he was quite upfront with her about his fears that despite the therapy he had sought and gone through, despite the fervent prayers that God would heal him, he was scared that he would still struggle in marriage with the demons of his unwelcome affliction. And yet he did marry to a woman he deeply loved as a friend and soulmate who loved him dearly and to walk with him at every step of the way as he realised his extraordinary potential 
as a minister of the gospel. His journey has been quite unlike mine sexually, but in other ways very much like mine because his experience brought him face to face with passages like Romans 1, which we're going to look at this morning, that appear to be entirely condemning of same-sex behaviour and even of same-sex desire, and had him wondering whether there might be another way of understanding these things. That's what we've been doing last week and this week. Today we conclude our two-part series on homosexuality and the Bible. Last week we concentrated on two verses from the Old Testament book of Leviticus, just two, just three, two of just three or four directly relevant passages in the Old Testament. This morning I will concentrate on Romans 1, which is just one of three passages directly relevant in the New Testament. Romans 1 is a crucial passage for our purposes for a number of reasons. Firstly, it is in the New Testament, which for Christians is likely to have more weight because, as we saw last week, lots of Old Testament laws and expectations are set aside as no longer relevant or important. Not eating prawns or pork, for example, or the Sabbath laws. Secondly, Romans 1 is the only passage in all of the Bible that appears to supply some reason, some rationale, for the Levitical prohibition of same-gender sex. The other two New Testament references in 1 Corinthians and 1 Timothy simply identify some forms of behaviour as morally unacceptable. There's no, but there's no reason given for these prohibitions. Thirdly, Romans 1 contains the only reference to female-to-female -female sexual behaviour. All other references are to men. Fourthly, this passage is crucially relevant because in some ways it is so irre irrelevant. When you look closely, it doesn't seem to be talking about homosexuality at all, or if at all, only at the level of behaviour. It does not appear to be speaking to or about the experiences of those people whose stories I've been hearing and reading about in the last few weeks. Let me explain. Paul argues in Romans 1 from verse 18 that human beings, although they know God, or at least have some awareness of God, suppress that knowledge. Human beings in general do this and have always done so. And this knowing ignorance of God manifests itself in idolatry and human beings creating idols, basically to allow themselves to do what they want. Idolatry leads to immorality of all sorts. And this is where the discussion of sex comes in. Idolatry opens the floodgates to sexual immorality in all of its perverse varieties. The floodgates is a good analogy because God allows it, according to Paul. He opens the floodgates as his way of punishing foolish people for exchanging the truth of God for lies. Verse 24. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the degrading of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. It is here that Paul introduces same-gender sexual activity. And for this reason God gave them up to degrading passions. Their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural. And in the same way also men, giving up natural intercourse with women, were consumed with passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own persons the due penalty for their error. This passage from Romans has been used for centuries as the major basis for Christian condemnation of homosexual behaviour. Men, men having sex with men, women engaging in sexual behaviour with women. But what makes this passage so apparently irrelevant for our purposes is that it doesn't seem to line up with our fast evolving understandings of homosexuality as a disposition or as a state of being. Paul is here talking about choices, the choice to ignore God, 
the choice to create idols in God's place, the choice to engage in degrading and unnatural sexual behaviour. This is a moral slippery slope that Paul is talking about, a process of degradation initiated by human choices. But we now have every good reason to believe that homosexuality as a disposition is not a choice. It is, in fact, something that people would prefer to unchoose often, if they could, at least up until recently. People of any disposition may choose to engage in homosexual behaviour, but as an orientation, it's not something people choose. This understanding of homosexuality is now widely, if not universally, accepted, even among Christians. A friend of mine sent me a book of his about sex, written from a quite conservative point of view. And this author, written last year or this year, happily acknowledged this growing consensus that this orientation is not a choice, nor is it something one can give up or repent of. For years, psychologists and counsellors have offered therapy to cure people of their homosexuality. They have all, there have been all manner of ex-gay ministries set up, some of which still operate here in Sydney, mostly run by Christians these days, it seems, because the wider medical and psychological fraternity no longer sees homosexuality as something that needs to be cured. Increasingly, people who have been involved in ex-gay ministries are admitting publicly and regretfully that these therapies don't work and often cause more harm than good. I was told during the week that Hillsong here in Sydney no longer recommends reparative treatment, I guess as an acknowledgement of the fact that there is no cure. This is not something that needs curing. So how does this influence our reading of Romans 1, which does seem to be talk about, talking about something that could be cured through repentance, faith and the help of the Holy Spirit? Something that is truly a choice can be unchosen. And so you can understand the incredible angst created by these verses for people like the man I was speaking about at the beginning of the sermon. Let's call him Jack. For person after person I've gotten to know, the discovery of their orientation was in the context of faithful and committed belief in God and Jesus. And so disturbed were they by this discovery that they had often gone to extreme lengths to change their hearts and minds and desires because of their belief in God and the Bible. Theirs wasn't the turning away from God, but to God, often in desperate attempts to reach out to God in the face of what for many ended up being, has ended up in suicidal despair. So what did Paul mean? How can we make sense of this fact that Paul appears to be speaking past or around our understanding and experience of homosexuality? I think the explanation is pretty straightforward. There are two related likely reasons for Paul's condemnation of same gender sex that will help us to resolve this cognitive dissonance. The first is that Paul believed in our terms, that people, all people, are naturally heterosexual and therefore are choosing to engage in same gender sex perversely. Paul didn't have the benefit of our distinctions that we now make between heterosexual and homosexual, and so even to talk in these terms is anachronistic. But reading these verses does suggest that Paul saw this behaviour as essentially corrupt. And as he looked around the Roman world, he would have seen all sorts of examples that would have confirmed him in, his, in this view. He would have known of drinking parties called symposia, where male and female slaves were brought in as part of the entertainment offered. He would have known of the frequent sexual abuse of girls and boys in the household of Roman citizens, the trade in young boys who were captured, imported, sold and then prostituted into sexual slavery. He would have known how acceptable it was in Greek and Roman society for a man to have sex with a woman and then for variety to have a younger man to take the role of a woman for him. 
And as a first century Jew, Paul would have seen all this as corrupt and corrupting, as I think we would too. And especially corrupt on the assumption that all people are by nature heterosexual, which leads to a second and related reason for Paul's condemnation of same gender sex, and that is that it was unnatural. Notice Paul's words in verses 26 and 27. Their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural. And in the same way also the men giving up natural intercourse with women were consumed with passion for one another. In describing same gender sex as unnatural, Paul had some influential allies within Greek and Roman intellectual circles. Plato, for example, described male to male female to female sexual relations is contrary to nature. Scholars have pointed out that much of this material from Romans 1 reflects sometimes word for word the writings of contemporary Stoic philosophers, including Seneca, who believed that an understanding of nature was the key to ethics, and that if something was contrary to nature, it was wrong. But for Paul, I think we can safely say much more influential than contemporary ethical writings was his knowledge of and commitment to the words of Leviticus, chapters 18 and 20, that we looked at last week. Paul understood from his Hebrew scriptures that God, in creating the world, separated things into kinds that needed to remain separate and distinct. He separated male from female, giving each to each a distinctive and complementary role, both socially and sexually. The gender divide is woven into the very fabric of nature according to Paul's likely understanding. So any confusion of this order is a violation of God's creative intentions. And it's also likely to have adverse personal and social implications. The demeaning and abusing of men, for example. Down the social path, able to be used for selfish. Paul would have shared his culture's aversion for a type of sex that was not only destructive but also often violent and abusive, which it certainly was in Greek and Roman society. So that is what Paul, I think, is likely to have thought about same gender sex. It makes sense. It makes sense of what he writes. It makes sense of his experience. But it still leaves us with the problem that what Paul wrote doesn't quite make sense of our experience and new understandings. We now know things about same gender sexual orientation and practice that Paul simply could not have understood. How could he? We are only just coming to understand these things ourselves. Which again raises the really important question, do these new understandings make a difference? Or more broadly still, are we at liberty to modify our understanding of things we read in the Bible on the basis of new knowledge? I think we can and must. And are not prevented from doing this because the Bible itself engages in this process, as has the church over many years. That's what I was trying to argue in my Sydney Morning Herald piece you might have read, where I have pointed out that the Christian church, in most of its varieties at least, has long since adjusted to scientific advances in areas of geology, biology and physics. We have very good reason to question the facticity of Noah's flood, for example, and I suggested we might need to do the same with homosexuality, something similar. Not everyone was persuaded by this argument, as you might know, if you maybe follow the discussion after the article came out in the world. A friend of mine rang up the other day and asked me, Keith, tell me again the link between Noah's blood and homosexuality. There are some obvious links, actually, with some very serious category violations involved in the lead up to the flood. Human beings having, having sex with angels and producing giants, for example. But the hermeneutical link is this. Just as we don't now accept a biblical cosmology or cosmologies in matters of geology and astrophysics, 
We also have reason to question biblical cosmology in the area of what is considered natural and unnatural. This matter of what is natural and unnatural is also an aspect of cosmology, our understanding of nature. There has been a shift, and we've all been part of it. And it has happened as gay and lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and intersex people have mustered the courage to tell their stories. People who are our brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, between 3 and 6% of our population, maybe more, as many as three times as many, as many as three times as many people than are redheaded. One in twenty, about one in twenty people you walk past on the street or work with every day are gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender or intersex. That that would be about the ratio of people I work with at probation and parole. We now know that for most people, this is not the result of choosing idolatry over God, though promiscuous and disordered sexuality could well be and often is. So we also now have the tragic phenomena of GLBTI people walking away from churches or never wanting to enter one, of people who, because of that rejection, pain and feel they have no choice but to throw their faith in altogether. This is not Paul's fault. It is our fault as Christians for our lack of love, our lack of effort to understand, our lack of courage to stand up for, to stand by and with our brothers and sisters and sons and daughters who are not heterosexual, for clinging unreasonably maybe to theologies and ways of reading the Bible that don't work. We have some repenting to do, that's for sure. And we certainly have the capacity to do that. Well, what is the way forward here? We do all need to think this through, not just accept what I say in a couple of sermons, but to go away and to think and to pray about it, to do some research and talk to some people, especially to those most vitally concerned. We might, after all our thinking and praying, still think that the right thing to do if we are gay or lesbian or bisexual is to not ever have sex or only ever have sex with someone of the opposite gender. Henry Newman was a gay man who decided on the basis of his understanding of scripture that he needed to remain celibate. And he was fully aware of the cost. He wrote this about sexual intimacy and our longing for it. Our sexuality reveals to us our enormous yearning for communion. The desires of our body to be touched, embraced and safely held belong to the deepest longings of the heart and are very concrete signs of our search for oneness. He felt he couldn't have that. And we need to respect and support those who think the same, whether gay or lesbian or straight. But I think we also need to respect those of our brothers and sisters who argue that on this issue we have liberty to follow the church's often slow, painful and disputed re rejection of slavery and gender role. Who believe that we can and must move on this as well for the sake of Jack and so many like him. I've called him Jack, but his real name is Jean, Jean Robinson, the gay bishop of New Hampshire. The days since his diocese chose him as bishop because of his extraordinary pastoral and other gifts, he received frequent death threats and constant vilification from fellow bishops and Christians worldwide. But he believed and still believes that he was doing the right thing, a bit like Luther, I guess, taking on the whole church, a bit like Sydney Ang the Sydney Anglican Church in its radical intention to go against worldwide Anglican communion. Anglican opinion by introducing lay presidency because they believed it to be the will of God. Jean Robinson went through all the pain of trying to shed his homosexuality, including the futile and damaging effort to maintain a marriage, which thankfully ended amicably and peacefully for the deep benefit of both. 
Within three years of their separation, both had remarried. In Jean's case, once New Hampshire allowed same-sex marriage to his partner, Mark, whom he met two and a half years after he and his wife were divorced. In his recently published book, God Believes in Love, which has back cover reviews from Barack Obama and Desmond Tutu, interesting as it may be, Robinson, Robinson writes these words about how he felt when he entered into the blessings of marriage. For the first time in my life, my heart and my body felt in harmony. For the first time, I was able to express my love for someone through my body. In a way I had never before experienced, I understood what the prayer book means when it describes marriage as a union in heart, body and mind. I experienced a wholeness and integration between body and spirit I'd only dreamed about. I remember thinking, so this is what all the fuss is about. No wonder people like and hallow this. I don't know where your journey has brought you on this broad issue of homosexuality. It may be that you simply can't accept this experience of Jean Robinson as legitimate or moral or wise in the light of your understandings of the scripture, scriptures and of life. But hopefully some of the major issues involved in coming to a mind on this have at least been raised in these two sermons. Let the dialogue and the prayer and the repenting 